There we go. How we doing? Doing good, man. We're in business, baby. Dude, it's been a busy week. Oh, that's for sure. So give that quick flex, though. Let them know without saying it. You got to go ahead and have the, uh, the thumbnail. <laughs> Only gains, Only baby. gains, yeah. <laughs> Love it. So give it, give it to me straight, right? Quantum, what is it? Quantum computing. Are we, should we be nervous about it? Is it, are we going to lose all of our, our crypto because of quantum computing? It's a complex question. Should we be nervous? I, I'm not nervous. Is it going to denigrate our cryptocurrency? Most likely not. And then it's also a question of timelines. I should note that quantum computing as it currently stands is a, a technology which exists, but projecting its ramifications on the future is a trans theoretical discipline hmm. because quantum computers are not yet at the point where they're capable of doing the things which their technology will allow them to do in the future based on their fundamental architecture and let alone be able to do that on a scale at which they would actually be operational for even a, a large institution let alone your average person Hmm. And let's I wouldn't be too nervous. Quantum real quick. Like what what even is like quantum sounds like it's from sci-fi, like something out of this world, right? What is quant like a quantum? Right. So quantum computing is a, a type of computation where the operations can harness the phenomena of quantum mechanics. Okay. So it, and that's why it's kind of trans theoretical because quantum physics as a whole is also a scientific study which relies a lot on theory. And physics does too. Theory doesn't mean that something isn't true or applicable. But what it does mean is that the farther you abstract something away from the real world, including time into the future, the more loosely you have to apply definitions. So in general, regular quantum mechanical topics will apply, such as superposition, interference, and entanglement. And it's essentially just taking those quantum mechanical properties and applying them to, what would you say, traditional computer sciences. Got you. Okay. Okay. And so th th there's a few things there. I, I think that we don't, it's not so much important specifically superposition, interference, and entanglement for our purposes, as much as it is just the overall high level ramifications. If you were to take this and kind of reduce it down to the level at which the average investor needs to know about or or someone who's interested in cybersecurity think about quantum mechanics applied to computing as something that would allow computers to do their job exponentially faster and understandably this is applied to encryption because it does imply that decryption would be faster with the quantum computer when applied against encryption of today. And that is absolutely true. The, the reason why I'm not too worried is two primary reasons. One is that currently the, the first generation of quantum computers are likely to not threaten symmetric cryptography algorithms mm -hmm. like AES, for example. If somebody has AES-256 applied to data at rest, for instance, and also data in transport using TLS, which is the HTTPS encryption methodology, also utilizes AES-256 nowadays, and at least AES-128, all the quantum computers would do is reduce the key size by half. And so AES-256, in terms of brute forcing against the entire search space of a given cryptographic key, it would be able to take that AES-256 and cut it down to AES-128, which still has never been cracked. The The reason why I think that it's valid for people to bring it up as a, as a generalized concern is that what I'm talking about is properly applied encryption. Properly applied encryption at the moment is not going to be threatened within the next 10 years by quantum computers. 99.9% .9 likely. Well, first, let's let's rewind back because how did this topic co even come to light, right? Did somebody, you know, because remember the ledger backdoor. So right. now there's a new concern. So where did the 
the uh, quantum computing kind of stealing all of our crypto come to light? And uh, yeah, just the backstory on that. Yeah, well, the how it came to our community, I think, is people kind of researching cybersecurity, current, past, and future threats, and then applying them to what we do in the cryptocurrency space. But this has been a very longstanding conversation in the, the field of cybersecurity, dating back 10 years or more. Hmm. Like, for example, six years ago, NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, hmm. they put out an announcement that they were going to have a competition for symmetric cryptography algorithms that would be quantum resistant. And now, present day, 2023, they've now listed the top six so-called winners of that. And I believe CISA, and a few other accrediting cybersecurity bodies that you know aid governments and and put out advisories for organizations and and so forth they have stated that AES is quantum resistant and nothing is quantum proof but nothing is decryption proof either what we do with generalized encryption is we measure the st relative strength of encryption using bits and it's called relative because Strong encryption is only strong relative to computing power in what they call search space. If you have a password of 10 characters and it's just 10 A's in a row, it, it has the same size search space as 10 randomly generated characters. But of course, it'll be easier to brute force the 10 A's. But assuming that a password has sufficient entropy, which is randomness, you can reasonably take the search space, you know, length times randomness, and you can calculate roughly how long it would take different kind of computer to decrypt the, the actual data within, you know, X amount of time. And of course, if you're talking about your average computer, it'll take much longer. If you're talking about your average supercomputer, it won't take as long, but a sufficiently strong password will still take a very long time. Quantum computers will be able to perhaps take the search space and get through it twice as quickly as the first stage of quantum computing because the way that generally to, to apply quantum 101 to computers, computers only know binary code mm -hmm. at the very bottom level of architecture. There's zeros and ones. And the way that we apply logic is zeros and ones. And what quantum computing will do with quibits instead of bits is it will make it zero and or one. So it's almost like Schrodinger's cat. If, if anyone has ever heard of that physics quandary where there's a cat inside of a box and it is not actually physically set in stone whether the cat is alive or dead until you open up the box in other words the this is actually relates to the concept of interference in quantum mechanics that our own perception may bend reality our own emf radiation may actually interfere with quantum units so it really does become a rabbit hole but in general a computer that does not have to pick a binary path within a maze and try out each path very quickly one by one but instead can search every path within a maze simultaneously is much faster but that is well i can understand why that's threatening to people but then you also have to consider this same technology will be used to encrypt data in the same right the 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 alarmists insofar as quantum computing are, is concerned. What they're doing is they're taking the future capability of quantum computers and applying it to encryption today. A note on the safety of cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency will be the last thing to worry about if a quantum black swan event comes true. In reality, TLS uses AES to encrypt web traffic. If you're connecting to an up-to-date uh, up domain and you know, it has modern, you know, TLS 1.3, so on and so forth, then you should be okay. And let's say that quantum mechanics evolved quicker than expected, and it undermined TLS. If we can't find a way to fix that, then cryptocurrency isn't really a concern. At that point, the internet as a whole would not be functional. Yeah. But in my personal opinion, and professional opinion, there's too much that information technologies is important for on the commerce side for us to ever let that happen. Yeah, definitely. And you said a couple of things there, bro, that just blew my mind because it just makes all like I have, I know zero 
about quantum computing before we just talk right now, but you breaking it down to the modern uh, computing, it's zero or one, but and or one and or one. And I'm just like, boom, like it just makes sense. Okay. So now there's just, they can, it can simultaneously do both and look at all basically angles as well as with the development and innovation that's going on in quantum computing I'm sure at the same time, simultaneously, people are building, you know, quantum, the the innovation in quantum resistance tools and IT and what have you is being developed as well, too. So it's not just like, oh, the like the negative side of quantum computing is, you know, going faster, it's developing faster and it's going to ruin everything. I'm sure there's another side that's built like balancing it out. Right. Exactly. And that's always been the game of cat and mouse that's occurred throughout many different disciplines outside of only cybersecurity, right? If, if we start making bullets out of a new galvanized material, we find a way to leverage that to galvanize our existing bulletproof vest. And it's just kind of like a basic game of cat and mouse. And it's not to say that there won't be disruptions as a result of quantum computing, but this conversation applies to all sorts of disruptive technologies. Like AI is another good example. We're worried about AI undermining security systems by evading detection and all sorts of other technicalities of cybersecurity defense posture. But by that same token, antivirus today in all, in all different types of defense technologies utilize AI to look for deeper trends and patterns within malware so that it's able to identify some malware when it ne- not, has not necessarily been identified before by taking commonalities between Malware, And so that's one example. And then same thing with quantum computing. You're going to be able to encrypt data with quantum computers and presumably in the same way that the Quibits allow this new age computer to search through a search space of possible encryption keys to find a match sooner. You could also generate keys using Quibits, which are essentially equal. Mm. It, it, it's like uh they they say and it's so cliche but it's so true a higher game of chess yep definitely and and is there certain cryptos or consensus mechanisms that sh- are more at risk to being hacked via quantum computing that is a, an amazing question that's the kind of thing to be honest that i could if i were going to do a phd It could be about that. There's just so much there. In general, the more established and instantiated a blockchain is, the more vulnerable it would be because it'd be harder to update. So I would, I'm going to guess, and anybody who hears this, who knows more, feel free to correct me. I'm going to guess that Bitcoin would be the most vulnerable because it's a legacy system. It, It relies on, on all the encryption technologies that perhaps would be, you know, existing today that are slower to change by that same token, no pun intended. (laughs) <laughs> perhaps Bitcoin is is also able to update in, in lockstep with existing technology. In fairness to Bitcoin, they have so far. It's not like they've kept the same, you know, web-based blockchain encryption that they very first started with. But I would imagine that the ISO coins would be the safest uh-huh. because all cascading changes to the ISO coins are applied faster just as part of their more meshed networked new age architecture in line with the likes of, you know, AWS and all that stuff. But there's no way in hell that AWS is going to let their company get destroyed by quantum computing. And also Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, and a lot of the other contenders for cloud-based bandwidth. And as long as the cloud-based companies don't lay down their sword and run when quantum comes rolling in, cryptocurrency as a whole won't either because a lot of cryptocurrency is being hosted on these servers mm-hmm. N- not all but but certainly a lot of it and so the the cloud technologies unless we think that they're going to get compromised permanently by quantum mechanics i don't see any reason to worry about cryptocurrency yeah good and and it kind of reminds me of like when the first computer came out i like i remember seeing a picture big ass computer at like ibm Right. And then I don't think it was maybe Apple that or Microsoft that really crunched it down to be able to give like laptops that now you can have a computer at your home. What stage would you say is like a quantum computer at? Because I do think I might have saw like a a picture of one in 
somewhere in China, a Chinese facility of like same kind of thing as computer that's quantum. But yeah, do do you think that we would have like individual kind of quantum computer laptops type of thing? Well, eventually that's the idea. And, and that is the kind of the technology development curve. But currently, as far as I know, we are at the stage before that of the massive IBM computer as of right now. So going back to the concepts of quantum mechanics, one of which being interference, the mere act of observation sends waves throughout reality. This is a very arcane concept, and it's one that is not as understood. We're almost like pre-Einstein's theory of relativity insofar as quantum mechanics is concerned. There are still some big gaps in our understanding, but we understand that there is this concept of quantum mechanics known as interference. Mm -hmm. And we're at the stage right now where quantum computers can only effectively conduct even the proof of concept experiments showing that the qubits can exist in sub-zero temperatures. Mm, okay, okay. So we're pretty early, but we can perhaps develop these new technologies much faster than we develop the old technologies. It's not to say that it will necessarily take longer, mm. but we certainly are early on in it. It's hard to make a prediction. So I'm not going to, this is going to be a personal opinion rather than a professional opinion, but I would be very surprised to see consumer grade quantum computers that are able to do the things that they're theorized to be able to do within the next 20 years. Yeah. That 50 would make sense. Years. It might happen, but they certainly wouldn't be consumer grade. Yeah, it, it just doesn't seem in the realms of like anywhere close to, you know, this decade of us kind of having those quantum computers or anything like that. Yeah, and the thing about technology adoption and technological advancement is that people are working today to make this a reality in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. But each development comes out, it hits the news. It's usually sensationalized and perhaps thought of as a little bit more advanced than it really truly is when you get into the brass tacks of it and, and research its limitations as well as its purported capabilities. But when one of those developments comes out, it's not like it's going to come out and then 99 more are going to come out immediately after. There's going to be time. If there is a, a single computer that was capable of quantum computing and, and decrypting a bunch of information, for, for all you cryptocurrency holders, what would happen first is you'd see the low-hanging fruit of publicly available resources being decrypted. Mm. And that would not be offline storage of cryptocurrency. Yeah. That's what you would see first, right? The, the, and there's a positive side to that, that we might actually be able to, for example, recover the cryptocurrency of the deceased and give it to their estate. And so there could be legitimate businesses formed around that technology. And after all, they do say that the most successful investment accounts are those of dead people, right? <laughs> That's true, because they can't sell. And there's time a lot of market, positives. Time in the market is your best bet. So that, that does right. make sense. Dude, I literally have zero idea about quantum computing. So like, I know you, I don't even know what to ask. So I know you wrote a bunch of notes for, cause I know Phoenix was asking questions. I know there was other people that had concerns. So if you wanted to kind of go through some of your notes and things that you found during your, your research. Absolutely. And I'm kind of scattered on it too, because my, my professional inclination is towards cybersecurity. However, this is kind of a concept that's very interesting. And I do enjoy the trans theoretical side of it. So perhaps we can go and research a little bit into kind of the different elements of quantum computing and then try to think about how that applies to, to cryptocurrencies. So right now, quantum computers are, are far too primitive to outperform classical computers for practical applications so so the, the the proof of concept models are it's almost like kind of like the the rough draft or like the 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 alpha release of a program showing this is how it would look for a business use case with minimal investment it's a it's a prototype as as you might call it in classical software development so they're they're definitely not there yet and there's also a lot of details that I'm not going to get into because nobody really cares that much. We just want to know general awareness. Yeah. So, yeah. so here we go. It's super high level. That's for sure. I'm looking at 
the quantum insider.com and looking at some like news and stuff that's came out and it is high level stuff, man. So one thing that is, uh, is I, I think to, to circle back to one of the questions, where did this hit our community yeah. is that there are some things for which quantum computing will present a problem for current encryption. And mind you, when I give my optimistic viewpoint that we'll be able to patch it by the time it comes out, I am right about that. But the people that are concerned are also right about that because we will have to patch it. Mm-hmm. And and there and there's never going to be a case where everyone patches it. So just like today, right? Unpatched systems are the number one cause of exploited software vulnerabilities. No surprise there. And in business, the amount of sprawl and growth of the profit first primary incentive does make it such that you're going to have a server online and in order to patch it for a vulnerability that came out last year you got to wait till next year mm-hmm. one example of a practical issue that it will present eventually is that it, it there's some computational problems that quantum mechanics won't help as much with as people think but there are others where it will help perhaps much more. One such thing is integer factorization, which is one of the mathematical operations that underlies RSA encryption. Mm. It'll be a lot faster than classical computers. However, RSA encryption doesn't have as much of a standing in encrypting data at rest, for example, as symmetric encryption algorithms like AES. Mm. But RSA encryption is one of the most commonly used asymmetric cryptography algorithms and it is part of the open vpn protocol but with it being that overarching throughout the computing and it space there's no doubt in my mind that that will have a patch long before the quantum computers actually pose a threat Mm -hmm. when we look at let's say quantum super superposition it is let's take a look at that because it's very difficult to visualize So we have right here, imagine touching the surface of a pond at two different points at the same time. Waves would spread outward from each point, eventually overlapping to form a more complex pattern. This is an example of superposition of waves. Similarly, in quantum science, objects such as electrons and protons have wave-like properties that can combine and become what is called superposed. Hmm. So the way that that applies to computing Let's take a look at the note for that. It's And this is a very high-level overview, meaning it's more of the, the generalizations rather than the low-level brass tacks. Did you want to share your screen? Yeah, let me do that. Yeah, okay, let me let's, make you. Let's, just, let's pull up the Wikipedia. I think that that gives the most high-level overview. All right, your host. There we go. So superposition is a fundamental principle of quantum mechanics. Here we have, actually, let's, let's hit it with actual computing. It's, it's kind of hard to find the computing alternatives because this has been longer standing in quantum mechanics. So here, here would be the high level overview. Superposition we have here is a weighted sum or difference of two or more states. In other words, it's a linear combination. And without getting into this specific example right here, this would be used to immediately synchronize computer systems as opposed to the way that we currently do it, where all technically all synchronizations between computer systems or even files have to be done on a differential basis. So that is one kind of way to look at it. And we can get really far into these nuances, but superposition is a sort of way of utilizing quibits to merge two different, let's say, transposed states. That's extremely abstract. That might mean computers as a whole. That might mean servers. That might mean files. That might even mean a single bit, a single data point. But it would be a way of saving energy, allowing the computer to do much, much more, perhaps four times as much in the way of transferring information. And if that's true on a bit level, then on you know a gigabyte level, it might be much more than four times as much. And some of this stuff we're still waiting to discover. The concept of interference has to do with the way that reality is impacted by the same waves that are that are outlined in superposition. Mm. So if we and we've heard of string theory, and as it turns out, there's now more in quantum mechanics about 
about how it's not so much strings, but waves. And interference is the reason why quantum computers can only work on such a constricted basis now. Mm. So those would be two big things. But to circle it back to the concept of cryptocurrency, this is a technology that's still very much in development. Anytime that you're watching videos about the threat of quantum computing, really look at the credentials of the people that are talking about it because what you're going to find, and hopefully me rambling for the last 10 minutes will show you that even a high level overview of this stuff is very dry. And so if there's somebody who's a crypto YouTuber selling you on something, they don't, they're not an expert on, on computing or quantum mechanics. Very true. Very true. And I, and you're, you're saying that, you know, you're not even an expert yourself. You're in it, you're cybersecurity. And so, but at least you have close to the credentials to be able to talk upon it and everything like that. Somebody that's just like making YouTube videos about crypto that, you know, doesn't even know about computing or any of that. I mean, you got to weigh the odds, right? Right. Like I at least have the basis of being able to somewhat understand it. Quantum computing is something that no one understands yeah. in the sense that it, let's say you have a really strong math background, which is probably closer to, to my case than physics. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to understand the cryptography side of it, but you're going to not get as far into the actual physics component about the way that electrons work, the way that the hardware engineering works. You know, the classic thing, right? Hardware engineers don't don't write software like software engineers. Software engineers may have very little to do with, you know, what happens inside of the computer. They just write software for it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. For me, I'll be the first one to say it. When it comes to science, right over my head, that was the only class that I did terrible in. My, actual, my science teacher called me a cheeseburger. <laughs> well, well, that's not nice. Because <laughs> he said, you know what? I was like, why are you calling me a cheeseburger? He's like, well, you know, after a while, after you have a cheeseburger, you just start to get sick of it. <laughs> and dude, I was Aww. like, damn. <laughs> but yeah, not good at science. But for the next five minutes, I want you to go toe to toe with David Schwartz, CTO of Ripple right now. All right. So quantum computing poses a serious threat to the future of crypto. Keep in mind, everybody that's watching, this was July 25th, 2020. So it's been like two over two years now so let's run through what he's saying and i want to get your viewpoint okay sure so all right we all know ripple cto david schwartz he said quantum computing would disrupt encryption algorithms that keep cryptocurrencies like bitcoin and xrp as well as the internet safe so to your point i mean this is not just a crypto problem this is a whole internet problem so Ripple T CTO, serious threat. So from the point of view of someone who is building systems based on conventional cryptography, quantum computing is at risk. We are not solving problems that need powerful computing like payments li and liquidity. The work that the computers do is not that incredibly complicated. But because it relies on conventional cryptography, very fast computers present a risk to the security model that we use inside the ledger. So... He goes into the algorithms like SHA-2 and ECDSA are sort of historic things deep in the plumbing, but if they were to fail, the whole system would collapse. The system's ability to say who owns Bitcoin or who owns XRP or whether or not a particular transaction is authorized would be compromised. All right, Alan, your take. Yeah. So the thing is that he's right. And let's say that I actually have the opportunity or when I have the opportunity to talk to this gentleman, mm -hmm. we will be in agreement. The, the difference is that I'm presenting an optimistic overall viewpoint because I, I'm optimistic about our community because I'll make sure that we have the patch management and I'll make sure that if there's an issue that is going to perhaps be very interfering, then we'll know how to protect ourselves and safeguard our assets. But he is right. And he made the same connection as I, which is that it's really the internet as a whole. What he's saying is if TLS is undermined, if if asymmetric encryption and overall service uh, server encryption is undermined by, you know, future looking quantum decryption capabilities, then yes, the, the, those technologies are what underlie Bitcoin and XRP. And the reason why Bitcoin and XRP, for example, are secure is because they don't try to reinvent the wheel insofar as cryptography is concerned. They're using the, the time-tested, 
encryption algorithms with lots of eyes on them that are that are approved by militaries and governments, the ones that work. Yep, hundred percent. He is right, and I do agree with that. And he says here the the algorithms like SHA two and elliptic curve, and that's what actually I was talking about the other day in the group. They're esoteric. If they were to fail, the whole system would collapse. And and so I agree. But my thing is that that's not even about cryptocurrency. The, yeah. the sys, I mean, there would be bigger problems. And the topic of this individual video is cryptocurrency. But if the whole system collapsed, you're not going to be worried about your cryptocurrency because the banking sector would go down. Yeah, hundred percent. Like he's not. Uh, I don't see that happening. Like I, not for this reason. Yeah. And I think that the banking the sector has plumbing. a lot of threats. What was that? The banking sector has a lot of threats. Most of those threats are due to monetary and fiscal mismanagement over a series of decades, as, as well as crony policy on part of policymakers. So quantum computing is the least of their concerns. But if quantum computing were what took the system down, there would be very little reason to try to preserve your your cryptocurrency assets. This is this is kind of like a, a zombie apocalypse scenario, in my opinion. Definitely. And he said a lot of people in the blockchain space watch quantum computing very carefully. And what they're trying to do is have an assessment of how long before these alg algorithms are no longer reliable. So any good business, any good innovator, they're they're not innovating for the now, they're innovating for the future. So they already they got eyes on it, right? So they're watching it closely and they're already gauging it along the way and developing solutions to bring to market if and when this becomes a big deal. So it talks about, he's been a developer, um, talking about it. So he says he thinks we have at least eight years. So eight years, he's saying he has very high confidence that it's at least a decade before quantum computing presents a threat. But you never know when there could be a breakthrough. I'm cautious and concerned observer, I would say. Right, right. And I think that that's true because when I was saying 15 years, 20 years, that was uh, the prospect of consumer grade devices. So I could see how that time could be cut in half or maybe even cut by more when it comes to it presenting a threat, which might imply that only one advanced persistent threat actor had access to this technology or a few of them. And what this will all ultimately come down to is cryptocurrency blockchains implementing patch management. So if you ever go onto the dark web, the Tor browser, and you go through the Tor network, some of those onion link resources, it will have a banner at the top that says that it's running a slightly deprecated version of some algorithm, some web protocol, and you know contact the administrator to recommend that they update it. And it'll also have a schedule where if it's not upgraded, it'll be taken down by a certain time. And, and, and the reason why I bring that up is because Tor is a good ex example on the web side of things of a decentralized network like cryptocurrency. And so this will come down to just patch management and following the same advisories that organizations and governments will. And this isn't to say that there wouldn't be a catastrophic scenario, but it is to say that it's not as much of a pressing issue. And I don't think that it's the biggest security threat. There's already enough security threats now. And I think that, well, let's put it like this. For people in our community, only worry about this if you already have your basic cybersecurity hygiene down. But if somebody, let's say, does not have good key management and perhaps does not utilize a password manager, no sense in worrying about quantum decryption. Uh, someone will just fish you. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, bro. And I'm reading this last thing here and I'm smiling and laughing because, dude, you are you and David Schwartz, you guys have the same brains. He's talking about, well, it all depends on your threat model. Right. That's like your motto. And right. And he's 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 right. The NSA is a way different entity than corporate raiders, who is what most cryptocurrency investors would be worried about. Crypto, what was the last thing you said? Most most cryptocurrency investors' threat model would probably be closer to like the corporate raiders or the, or the people that are, or perhaps uh, corporate raider, I suppose, applies to a corporation, but corporate raider is also just somebody that's out for money. And, and also they, they target crypto exchanges. Mm, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And that's what ultimately the same conclusion that you came to 
David Schwartz had said too, is that, are you worried about the NSA breaking your payment system? And then he concluded that as soon as it's clear that there's a problem, the system will probably be frozen until they can be fixed or improved. So most people don't have to worry about it. So what's all the fuss about, Alan? You tell me. It's because it's something that's esoteric and ill understood and flashy and interesting and futuristic and all scientific, you know, bundled in one. And so it's the perfect kind of boogeyman. It's it's the perfect pie in the sky. Yeah. And I don't mean to denigrate the concern by calling it a pie in the sky, but it is the perfect pie in the sky if you were looking for one. So yeah, we did come to a very similar conclusion. Let me put in another note about this because this is just kind of making me think about broad, high-level security. Is I, I was watching a show recently on Netflix. I'll, I'll have to get the get the name recent uh, later for the members of our community. But it's it was a big Netflix series about spies and the way that technology has evolved over the last forty years for covert operations and like you know spies. Mm -hmm. And I would posit that way before we see even an advanced persistent threat actor, like let's say uh, a national adversary who kept this technology a secret and is using it on us, way sooner than that, if we had a lot of blockchain resources and we had continued our, our evolution towards the new financial system, we're going to see actual covert operations, right? Before anyone has quantum computers to target at us, I think that you're going to see like spies trying to work their way closer and get those keys. And even when quantum computers are are up and running, I think it's still going to be very expensive to try to leverage them as a weapon. And so it would this in the same way that you know missiles are very expensive and you don't want to just fire them off capriciously. I, I, quantum computers would be the same way. And so you you'll see spies and and that's an example of social engineering from the cybersecurity perspective. So let's say that someone's threat model were sky high in the United States and they were worried about quantum computers being used against them magically. That's why I call it a, a pie in the sky, because in reality, with a team of people. What you really try to do is you try to undermine the physical layer of IT. You can have great security practice, but if somebody has the authority or the ability to physically tap your wires, compromise your router, or get a warrant to you know tap your phone, that's how you really compromise somebody. the The idea of of advanced computing being used to target people is mostly unrealistic. It just doesn't happen the way that it, that it can happen. And I think one of the big reasons is cost. Conventional law enforcement and conventional spy covert operations tactics are much more effective than hacking for getting information if you look at it through the historical lens. Hmm. And I think I know what Netflix show you're talking about. It's how to be a spy. Yes, that's what it is. <laughs> yep. Yep. I, I watched a little bit of that. I think that came out like maybe six months ago, a year ago, but yeah, it was good. One other thing while I have you, Alan, I know you have to get dinner, but <clears throat> the, uh, the, the talk from the world economic forum and how there's going to be a cyber pandemic in two years. I I'm going to see if I can pull it up. Cyber yeah. Pandemic. Yeah. Cause I'd like to really know, what specifically their motivation is for saying it, because I agree with them that the the danger is mounting in general, but it, it'd be nice to see the details. Yeah. So they, they warn of a catastrophic cyber event likely. Yep. So this was January 20, 2023, two days ago. So let's see if there's a video here. This is more like a sales pitch right here. Right. I think I can find it on YouTube. Yeah. Now, I did see that brief statistic about how a data breach in the United States costs twice the global average to remediate. And in my professional experience, observing, that has been true. It, it is more expensive for, for a whole host of reasons. All right, let's see. Global poly crisis. Is this, should I do this one? Yeah, let's let's look at it. All right. Are warning of dangers facing the planet as they, the world's elite are warning of dangers facing the planet as they gather in Davos, Switzerland. 
More than 2,700 people are attending the World Economic Forum. The guests range from the chief of the European Union to actress, actor, pardon me, Idris Elba. Those who are privileged enough to join are tasked with solving some of the world's biggest problems. The World Economic Forum laid out some of those problems in its Global Risk Report. It warns that COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine have thrust the global economy into different times. It says, quote, the resulting new economic era may be one of growing divergence between rich and poor countries and the first rollback human development in decades. Neil Irwin joins me now. He's the chief economics correspondent at Axios. So, Neil, something outlined in this report is the risk of a polycrisis, which is the word of the moment and the word of Davos. It's essentially multiple global crises happening at once that knock into each other like billiard balls. Is this a new phenomenon we should be worried about or just another way of saying what we already know, which is that the world is complicated? Yeah, I, I certainly a lot of things that are unique about this moment in world history and economic history, uh, inflation and rising interest rates, uh, global warming, uh, conflict in Europe with Ukraine, the risk of further conflict to other parts of the world. Uh, it's, it's all complex and it's all uh, challenging. Uh, in some ways, that, that's what history is. <laughs> history is a series of, of challenges humanity faces that uh, sometimes get resolved in, in peaceful good ways and sometimes in not so good ways. Apart from the terminology, I think there is something important here, which is that this is a delicate moment for the world economy, for the world geopolitical sphere, and that's what these uh, global leaves scattered in Davos, which are under really talking about. And when you look at the long-term risks, four of the top five long-term global risks outlined in this report are climate change related. Failure to mitigate climate change, failure of climate change adaptation, natural disasters, biodiversity loss, Package all those together. What what can these crises, these environmental risks, lead to in terms of destabilizing the global economy? There's a lot of moving pieces. There's uh, there's kind of migration, and as some places on Earth become less inhabitable, do we have mass migration into into other places, and all the political and economic destruction that can cause? There's also just the scale of the investment needed to mitigate and address climate change. We're talking about trillions of dollars over over decades. You know, and that can crowd out other types of. I think they're talking about the climate one. Let's go to the the other one, which has the the cyber attacks. Right. I thought that the, I thought it would include cyber in there. Oh, here it is. I think this is it. Yep. Let's see. Um, we recently came out with a report where 93% of cyber executives and 86% uh, of business executives have said that they expect a catastrophic cyber event over the next two years. Now, that's pretty significant. What's even more significant is that 43% of those surveyed actually believe that they could materially be affected by an incident, right? So these things are pretty big. And uh, critical infrastructure protection, especially in light of the geopolitical instability, becomes one of the key focus areas. If we look at our global risk perception survey that we published very recently, the security of critical infrastructure is top of mind is top by this. Right. And uh, you know, the the recent cyber attack at Ains, right, that was perhaps one of the most critical that happened in India. Have you had a chance to study it? What can the Indian government learn from this to ensure that, you know, this doesn't happen moving forward? Look, first of all, I would say that, you know, preparedness is very, very important, but cybersecurity is a bit of a special animal, right? The moment there's an incident that takes place, imagine, for example, if you lose something, if you're a victim of a theft or anything in, in physical realm, there is always a lot of empathy that surrounds it, right? But whenever there is a cyber incident, I think the dynamic is pretty different, right? All of a sudden, your question also is, where has the government gone wrong? I don't think the government has gone wrong. The issue is very complex, you know? I mean, there is a high degree of preparedness that we need to bring in, and we need to ramp up our defenses. We really need to sort of invest more in cybersecurity. Now, take the case of a typical hospital, right? And AIMS is a good call to action because it's the country's premier hospital. But I'm even more concerned about the vast majority of hospitals that are very small outfits. What capacity do they have to invest, one, in uh, requisite technology? And second, which is honestly a really big problem, is the talent gap. 
There's a reported talent gap, as is the case globally. I mean, if you look at global statistics, there's a shortage of about 3.4 million. They just need to hire you. Now, that's the big challenge. If there is a massive shortage, jobs are up for grabs. Uh, a good cybersecurity professional would probably prioritize a job with, say, for example, one of the large technology companies, you know. What happens to sectors such as healthcare? What happens to sectors such as education, right? And these are perhaps among the most vulnerable, honestly, attacks against healthcare, attacks against humanity. Right. I also want to understand in terms of policy and infra, what are the challenges in India's measures when it comes to dealing with cyber attack? So I think when it comes to India, we have a really, really strong working relationship with the National Cybersecurity Coordinator's Office, uh, General Rajesh Pant. In addition to that, a large number of organizations are working with us. So I would say that, you know, I think there is uh, a propensity to come on a global platform and learn from some of the best in class practices. Uh, the cybersecurity policy that we have in India it dates back to 2013, and I know that the government is about to release one really soon, so that's going to be a much awaited uh, okay. measure. But if we also think about it, uh, regulations as a whole are playing a massive role in terms of enhancing uh, cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So we, we did a survey very recently, and uh, we discovered that 73% of professionals actually believe that regulations and privacy guidelines can have a very positive impact on cybersecurity. Yeah. Take, for example, the recently launched incident reporting guidelines in India, right? Mm -hmm. It's a step in the right direction. Where we can do more is build awareness about what needs to be reported. Mm -hmm. How should businesses adapt their posture so as to be able to comply with them? So there's more that needs to be done. I also must commend the government because energy infrastructure, when it pertains to that, the Electricity Amendment Act also includes a cyber provision whereby the government has the right to go and do periodic inspections of uh, grid infrastructure. So that all of these are steps in the right direction. Obviously, it takes time. Resilience is not something that can be enabled from one day to the other. It's a journey. But I think all the steps that we are seeing are more or less in the right direction. Right. What role can international cooperation frameworks play when it comes to tackling cyber attacks? And, you know, what role is the WEF playing in this regard? Absolutely. You know, if we look at the nature of cyberspace, mm -hmm. it does not have any territorial borders, right? So it is essentially borderless. So any response that we want to mobilize against cyber attacks needs to be a global response. And that's fundamentally the belief that we have here at the World Economic Forum. So if I look at the Center for Cybersecurity, you know, I mean, we're working very, very hard to make sure that there's public-private cooperation on this important topic of cybercrime. We look here in Davos, you know, I mean, we have represent strong representation from law enforcement agencies. We've had a lot of discussions with cyber executives and all. And I think that's what is required. Oftentimes, when we hear about it, right, working with law enforcement, invariably, the private sector tends to go only when, you know, I mean, there are some bad news. We don't work with law enforcement in the prepare phase. Mm -hmm. And that's actually really important. For example, you know, I mean, when there is an incident, we should have the ability and confidence in uh, law enforcement officials to come and work with us, you know, I think, and that's something that can be built over time. So international cooperation is very, very important. I think working with heads of other national cyber agencies, because everybody is facing the same problem, right? And I think we need to think about common approaches that can have maximum impact. I mean, Akshay, what does the future landscape look like when it comes to cybersecurity and cyber attacks in India? So I'd again go back and then say that, you know, I, I don't think India is isolated in that respect. So whatever we're seeing at a global level is pretty much going to manifest in India. Uh, you know, I mean, we're seeing critical infrastructure is a top of mind uh, issue when it comes to cybersecurity. It uh, doesn't mean that ransomware, which has been much spoken about over the past couple of years, is going away. It's definitely there to stay. What is even more worrisome is the fact that, you know, I mean, the noise that we see is almost around large-scale ransomware attacks. What we don't see is the small ticket. And I'll just make an analogy with the telco art movement of these, right? It's uh, either we look at high average revenue per user in certain markets, and, you know, and it's like large ticket size. Or we're looking at markets such as India, you know, I mean, where it's like a very small ticket size. But, you know, I mean, if you look at the scale, it's a massive amount. Now, mm -hmm. ransomware is the same, you know, I mean, we are focusing on uh, millions of attacks that basically where the ransom demanded is in millions. But I'm very concerned about the ones that are not even reported. But the ticket size is really small, but the frequency is very, very high, right? So I think that's a big problem that we need to think about. Lastly, you know, I mean, we are increasingly seeing 
that attacks are not so much about extortion, but it's more about, you know, I mean, wiper attacks. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you go in and you just wipe out the system because, I mean, it's uh, causing total destruction in businesses. I think that is very, very severe as well and needs to be addressed. I think there is a massive opportunity for India over here, and I would almost sort of drill down on the fact that there is a massive uh, talent gap now. If we're thinking about India, you know, I mean, we have a young population. We have uh, a population that has a technology bent in mind. A lot of our students uh, naturally gravitate towards technical domains. I think there is a massive opportunity here for us. If we are able to train cybersecurity professionals, we will not only serve the markets in India. Is there an organized way of going about it, you know, training cybersecurity professionals? Because So what are your thoughts on that, Alan? I he's completely right. Mm -hmm. And he's he's kind of talking about India because that clearly he's going in as kind of being an ambassador for for India. But what he says is true in general. And actually, that's why when we were talking about the threat of quantum computing against cryptocurrency, blockchains or individual private keys, my thought was that there will be much bigger problems if quantum computing comes to threaten the Internet and the basic technologies of encryption that we rely on. Banking is one example. Hospitals. I mean, we can go down the list of, you know, what, whatever the the triad might be banking, hospital and groceries. Mm -hmm. Right. But either way, I mean. You're certainly right that an attack on healthcare in particular is an attack on humanity. And the thing about cryptocurrency for, for all those listening is that if you own your own keys, then you can count your cryptocurrency as safe and just make sure that you pay mild attention to developments within the cybersecurity space over time. But you certainly don't have to look too closely because before cryptocurrency gets hit with a quantum threat, there will be other problems that will surface first. A, a threat actor may vary in their motivations and their capabilities, but individuals who, who hold cryptocurrency, I can promise, will be on the bottom of most of those persistent threat actors lists. Yeah. That's not a, that may not be a, a good thing for, for their targets, but it, it, it just goes to show, I mean, the, 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 when we're threat modeling in a professional environment, we usually use some sort of prior prioritization strategy because you can't strategize against every threat at every level at all times. And so what we do is we use one such example is threat cross table, where we take the probability of occurrence for any given year, let's say, and multiply it by the severity of impact. And let's say that the matrix includes zero through five or one through five probability of occurrence and one through five severity of impact. And you simply multiply the two numbers and then it'll either come up as uh, green, yellow or red in terms of its overall impact. For example, a ransomware attack that impacts a large swath of business systems is severely impactful, but its probability of occurrence isn't as high. And, but you might still categorize it as a moderate threat because it has a low probability of occurrence, let's say zero through two times per year, but its severity is a four or a five. And so perhaps that lands it in the yellow zone. And then you have other things that would have a large impact and the, uh, they are they happen or they are attempted frequently, like phishing, for example. That might a successful phishing attack might show up as a, a priority for you because it's both impactful and likely to happen. And so if we were to take that professional risk modeling stratagem and apply it to quantum computing, I would say it's a large impact. So it's large in the severity index, but but um, currently very low in the probability of occurrence impact or probability of occurrence uh, coefficient. And so it's not as much of a, of a risk. And talking about quantum computing as a threat is one thing. Talking about it in rank order with other threats is a whole other thing. And that puts it into perspective. I would I would be much more concerned with the banking sector and the hospitals, not because they'll be targeted per se, but because of the impact of if they had a, a, a poly crisis, as it were. Yeah, definitely. And it's funny how they said that it would be an international like regulation, just because just like crypto, it's not set to one, you know, borders. It's a worldwide thing. So is the cyberspace. So cybersecurity regulations, as well as crypto regulations, 
would likely come at an international conference like the World Economic Forum. Couple things that I'm doing, like a summary of 2023 events thing, so we can kind of foresee some of these international conferences. I'm going to make a whole list, like the G7 conference that's coming out. I think it might be in December, but there's some that I think there's one in May. And we can kind of see ahead of time, hey, when is an announcement or like what time frame is a, an announcement likely to happen? Another thing we can look at too is the charts will tell us what is going to happen in in the real life. So what are what's one big cybersecurity company? Cybersecurity company, <laughs> I would think Mandiant is one. How do you spell I it? I think it's a M A N D. I-A-N-T. I think that Ma- Mandion is their current name, and they used to be known as FireEye. There they are. So they're from, is that India? Let's see. It looks like it's the top one. I'm not yeah. sure where they're from. I think so. All right. Yep. Let's see. Looks like they just came out. I want to say that it could have been some restructuring. They were known as FireEye for a while. And uh, and I believe that they're a security researching group, and actually they are they're the ones who are responsible for initially detecting the solar winds breach, and uh, and alerting the. I think that they they discovered the vulnerability within the solar wind software, and then reported it out, which was which was primarily why the, then the U.S. government identified the presence of that vulnerability within their own infrastructure. Oh, okay. But but they went by FireEye back then, but it's the same group. I guess there's a cybersecurity, global X cybersecurity ETF. I like that. That 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 would be worth investing in. I I think I'll I will invest in that personally. Legit. I'm looking at this like, I mean, you got a one week prepared to buy soon, but also at the end of the day, like having an ETF where invest in a basket of cybersecurity companies, especially here in what we just heard from World Economic Forum, all that stuff might be a great call. This came out in 2020, but uh, you know, it's corrected ever since 2021. And just like the stocks, just like crypto, it looks like it might be in for a big bounce. It's at 21 bucks. It's all time. I was 35, you know, just starting to think about some of these trends that are going to play out over this decade and cybersecurity is going to be a big one. So yeah. Yep. So this looks good. If there ends up being some sort of cyber black swan event or even just, you know, a large uptick that's continuous in cyber threats, then investing in something like this or a particular cybersecurity firm might be tantamount to investing in Moderna or Pfizer back in 2019. Absolutely. You know, because the government's going to come in and say, who can we turn to to help us with this impending crisis? And they're going to inevitably turn to the organizations which already exist, which are already on the NASDAQ. And then they're going to funnel government money in, just like what happened with those two large pharmaceutical companies. Yep, 100%. And I, dude, you're on the money. Because they were saying we were in a, a health pandemic and they were saying there's going to be a cyber pandemic. And to me, the momentum is just starting to kick up here. Right. Well, well, think about like the TED Talks that Bill Gates had and and kind of the correspondence with the Obama administration and that the uh, that lab that we had funded in Wuhan and, and all that stuff that was happening, like, let's say 2014 to 2016. Mm-hmm. And then three to four years later, then we had and with that foreshadowing came the pandemic. And so now I think that we're kind of slightly past that 2015 stage of foreshadowing for the cyber pandemic. Now they're using the word. So yeah, it wouldn't be surprised if it came within the next 12 to 24 months. I think in 2025, we'll have the, those proof of receipts. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, we absolutely. This volume uptick right here at, and we're going down just like you see a volume uptick right here. And then we just started going down from that point. It looks like a bottom's in. So it is looking like, I would say, I mean, you're going to probably start to see this go up or this whole rest of the, this year. And then 2024 to 2025 could start to get parabolic. So like, I think that, you know, anything when it comes to cybersecurity is going to be on the top of the agenda for a lot of these companies out here. And it, just for individuals as well, too, having good security practices, as you said in, in the past videos, is just a must. You know, we're going into this 
the stage in the world where it's we're at a critical crossroads. I think 2023 is going to be the deck the year that decides this next decade. So it's interesting times ahead, man. Absolutely. I'm very bullish on cybersecurity and and I know that I'm going to be paid. So um, (laughs) that's really the good part about it is that there is a huge talent shortage. And as much as I've done a lot of hard work to get where I am in the cybersecurity field, I certainly believe that that talent shortage was part of what's responsible for my rapid entry into the cybersecurity workforce right out of school. Because generally that's hard to do. You generally have to you know, get a large amount of requisite experience before you can touch that stuff. But if you're able to prove yourself, organizations are really looking for cybersecurity now. Yep. And Alan's starting his new course, how to get into cybersecurity from A to Z. Yep. Yeah. We're going to integrate <laughs> a lot of Linux stuff. And in, in general, I'm going to teach Linux, but with an operational security bent, because a lot of people like Linux because it's the first operating system that they'll ever use that you don't have to sign an end user license agreement or you click I agree. There is none of that. It's free software. And there's no corporation that will be able to monitor your activities or fetch your diagnostic data. And by that same token, there's also no organization that can help you if you screw something up. So it really is a great example of taking data into your own hands. And custody is the best way to secure data, right? If you want to secure anything in the real world, you take physical custody over it first and foremost. And so to have to have a knowledge of where your your let's say your assets, your digital assets are dispersed throughout physical space and throughout logical space, which that's a little bit of an IT concept. That's the first step in security rather than worrying about quantum computers. Say, what is my data? And I don't mean, you know, advertiser data, but I mean, you know, your passwords, your photos, your applications, your devices, your accounts. And then say, well, roughly where are those, you know, you can assume that a lot of the cloud data is dispersed throughout the Western hemisphere on cloud servers, but then logical space, right? Where is, regardless of where your data is in physical space, what state is it in? Is your data secure at rest? And is it secure in transport? And you can cover transport security by making sure to only connect to HTTPS websites and making sure to use a VPN when you're outside of your home network and especially on public networks. And you can secure data at rest by encrypting software or in- encrypting data before putting it onto the cloud and, and or selecting software that does that for you. Right. And the latter of those two options is really all the rage right now. Like if you, let's say, you put stuff into OneDrive, Google, Google Cloud, Google Drive. You can use Cryptometer, set a password, and it'll, on your local machine, encrypt the data with your password so that this encrypted blob is what ends up on your cloud storage provider. But even if a hacker were to get into their server or an, a rogue employee were to try to compromise you specifically, your data would be indecipherable without the encryption key, which never left your machine. And then couple that with a good password manager. And that is what we would call secure. Nice. All right, Alan, thank you so much. I know you got to get dinner, you're probably starving right now, but we appreciate your time, bro. If you want Alan to keep doing these weekly, like the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, come join the discord too, because we got the security privacy chat. Any remaining questions that you have after watching this video, shoot a message in there and Alan will respond to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rob. I'm honored to be part of this community and everybody listening, do sign up. I promise you won't regret it. Hell yeah, bro. One more. One more. Let's see him. Yeah, baby. baby. All right, bro. I'll talk to you later. Over and out.